Thank you very much, Pippa, for your nice introduction. Indeed, uh, these walks were very nice and uh, thoughtful. Even we did not find a real uh, agreement at the end. However, you will see some of your thoughts will be here. The title, as you can see, is quite a famous quotation from even a more famous political scientist most of you know in the room. And I will come back to this quotation during my talk. I will immediately uh, start and show you the cognitive map which should lead me and which should lead you through my talk. I'm using concepts here, and concepts in political science, social science in general are normally contested. And uh, these concepts I'm using here are in particular contested. I'm talking about what I mean by democracy. I'm talking about the problems to con conceptualize crisis, crisis of democracy. I very briefly talk about uh, major findings and problems of democratic theory and crisis theory. And then I come back to this quotation and the famous political scientist talking about why do I think legitimacy belief is not enough to approach such a question whether democracy is a crisis or not. And then I propose three theories how to look from an empirical point of view to this crisis question. The background of these empirical view is a book <coughs> which we did at the WZB with my department, which we did not call deliberately, uh, deliberatively uh, crisis of democracy, but crisis and democracy. I think there is quite an important semantic uh, difference. <coughs> I'm not talking about these 503 uh, adjectives which are used in the literature in order to specify about which democracy we are talking. And here I'm just uh, presenting certainly an under complex uh, subsumption of these different uh, concepts of democracy under three headings. The one are the minimalists. Minimalists. Uh, this is clear to you, uh, are those who think it's not only that elections are the most important part of democracies, ge uh, general and free and sometimes fair election, but they are the essence, they are democracy uh, itself. There's a group of people who thinks elections cannot be anything and cannot be everything of uh, uh, democracies. There must be something more. And of course, uh, in the forefront is Jürgen Habermas, who talks about the co-originality of civic and political rights. There are minor and uh, less known political scientists here in this line, and they also think Democ uh, elections cannot be uh, the only thing in order to judge whether a democracy is in crisis or not. And then you have maximalists. Maximalists have been throughout the last three decades a dying species. It was very important in the 60s and the 70s and uh, maximalists uh, are distinguish themselves from the two first groups, that they are not lo looking only to input factors or throughput factors, to use the terminology of David Easton, but they are also looking at outputs. But if you have such a maximalist concept, where I have some times, if I write theoretical pieces, I have a normative preference for it. It's clear they cannot travel. They can especially not travel to the United States and uh, uh, you, cannot, uh, you cannot really use it if you do uh, large and comparative research on the development of democracy. Here my point is basically that I'm arguing 
the type of democracy you are relying on determines to a large extent the sample of those countries who may be in crisis. If you are choosing a minimalist concept, only looking at elections, you will not have a large sample of countries. But if, of course, you have a maximalist concept, you will see uh, more or less each country, or you can come up with a conclusion they are in crisis. Maybe these wonderful, nice, cozy uh, Scandinavian uh, countries as an exemption. This is, and I don't run through everything, uh, this is uh, what I uh, what I do understand uh, as a mid-range concept of democracy, and you see here the core is also, the core are elections. But in order to make democratic elections democratically meaningful, they have to be embedded. Embedded is one of my preferred uh, uh, terms I'm using here. They have to be embedded in other a partial regime. I'm talking here about five partial regimes which constitute uh, a rule of law based democracy. I prefer rule of law based democracy to liberal democracy uh, because liberal democracy is differently understood in uh, many European countries and the United States. So you need these regimes of political rights and of civil rights. You need checks and balances. And you also need an effective power to govern. And here I should uh, explain briefly what I mean. I argue that in democracies only those authorities are legitimized to launch authoritatively binding decisions for the whole society which are elected for these decisions. If we look to Latin America, to Asia, to not, not so well established democracy, you will see very often military is such an actor which challenged the effective power to govern of uh, democratically elected regimes, but you don't have only to look to this country, look into the European Union, for example. Look at the role of central banks. Who the hell has legitimized uh, Mario Draghi to solve uh, parts of the Euro crisis? He did, he did on dem democratically uh, uh, very uh, loose ground. However, economically, I would say it was the right thing to do. And you have challenges coming. So what I have placed here in the corner, certainly not the only one, but the major one I see at the beginning of the 21st century. And I see socioeconomic inequality as one of these challenges. I come back to this point. Certainly globalization, but I also see uh, the Europeanization of domestic politics as a tremendous uh, challenge of democracy, which are not solved yet in the European Union. And there is something uh, which is more problematic, heterogeneity, heterogeneity in ethnic terms, heterogeneity in religious terms. Uh, meaning this is something which explains to some extent uh, the emergence of the radical or populist right in Europe. So this is what I understand as uh, a democracy. And to some extent, if you have these five uh, partial regime, you can locate much better where does democracy has problems which uh, it has not solved yet. And you even can follow in on a kind of trajectory where the virus of defects, of democratic defects, is spreading across the whole regime. I distinguish two types of crisis. The one is a more unproblematic one, coming from the medical metaphor of a uh, crisis of human um, <coughs> beings, human individuals, meaning if you don't uh, uh, 
bring in the right uh, cure, the right medicine, then the patient will die. So this kind of crisis is an existential one and is a question of death or life of democracy, um, book of a well-known political scientist or historian as well here in the room. Uh, so there's a crossroad, uh, there are uh, the fundamental decisions required and I just listed some of these uh, examples uh, where the countries have seen such a crisis. And very often you can often only uh, state ex post whether a regime was in crisis because it collapsed. This is one of the problems, the second concept or meaning of crisis certainly <coughs> has. Here, crisis is understood as a slow decline, a click decline, an erosion of the quality of democracy. This is, by the way, the, most, the way in which the term crisis is mostly used if it comes to democracy, if we are talking about the 30 or 40 uh, OECD uh, democracies. It starts very much in the 1970s again. By the way, the term crisis and uh, democracy is associated now for more than 2,000 years. We have it uh, in the writing of Plato, Aristotle, Polybius. Uh, but it uh, emerged, popped up again in the 1970s, and one of the main books was Habermas' uh, book on the crisis of legitimacy. Here, crisis is understood that democracy, real existing democracies, do not fulfill the normative promises of democracy. Uh, this can lead to what uh, Kolya, Levitsky, and others have called a diminished subtype. There are still democracies. There's, to some extent, uh, regular and general and free and sometimes even fair elections, but the other part of regimes are under tremendous pressure and uh, you can locate uh, democratic deficits within them. One of the major uh, problems this concept of uh, crisis has, it cannot determine when a crisis begins and when it ends. And if you uh, read uh, the articles of my uh, good colleague and friend Klaus Hoffe, then you will see democracy is permanently in crisis since the 1970s. But then the meaning of crisis becomes semantically meaningless. If something, if crisis is a normal state of democracy, why should we use then such a term? And here is clear, uh, if you, again, if you are relying your analysis or base, uh, if you base your analysis on such a more loose concept of crisis, you will have quite a large sample of cases. However, the threshold question is not resolved. And I still think uh, these are, uh, this is not uh, occasionally the case because uh, I don't see how you really can uh, determine a non-arbitrary threshold between crisis and non-crisis. So a crisis theory should explain which are the property of a crisis. Here the Habermas of uh, Jim O'Connor, uh, Colin Crouch, uh, just to name a few, are uh, quite good in defining these uh, properties. Uh, they are not so good what a necessary and sufficient condition is to use these uh, terms from um, Aristotelian logic. And of course, what I have said, threshold questions are not solved. <coughs> Causes and effects, they are much better, but it's quite interesting that very often they think an economic crisis determines and triggers a political crisis, a crisis of democracy, I would argue now it's more the triumph. The triumph of a specific type of economy, the triumph of capitalism, which challenges uh, the working 
of democracy. So it's not the crisis, it is the triumph of capitalism. Uh, just to, uh, to show you that I read some of these uh, crisis theories, uh, and they are, of course, uh, much more complex than here, uh, but I try to filter out the main argument. There's the legitimacy crisis, and here the major point is there is at a certain stage of the development of the crisis, the people withdraw their support from the most important uh, democratic institutions and organizations. Only two years later, we had this commission, the trilateral commission under the obvious leadership of Sam Huntington. They are talking, governments are therefore in a crisis because they became big governments. They took on too many obligations and they cannot fulfill them. And there is also a uh, too high demand of citizens for participation and material goods and services. Then uh, the globalization, I leave this out, and this is this famous essay by Colin Crouch. And then multiculturalism, if somebody read this strange book of Sam Huntington, which is quite good at the beginning, but at the end he obviously loses his mind sometimes. <laughs> uh, uh, so he sees everywhere uh, these, especially the Hispanization of the United States in Germany or in continental Europe, they would see the Islamization of the community. However, there is certainly a subjective perception of parts of the population which uh, con uh, conceive this as a threat to a certain object of the political regime, meaning the political community, or if you want to use another term, the nation. I skipped this, and I briefly tell you how we tried uh, to make sense of the question. We used three types of analysis. We is not the pluralis majestatis. This is uh, the group uh, at the WZB. We first followed uh, the famous Weberian or Pippa Norris uh, track. Uh, we were looking at legitimacy belief. What do the people think? Should it be not the most important thing, but the demos thing? And if the demos think that democracy is in a crisis, then he could be the last arbiter. Could he? I don't think he can be the only uh, uh, group who can judge whether a democracy is in crisis. You need normative standards. Otherwise, uh, you will find many examples in history where the people think uh, uh, they are, or the people think their regime is legitimate, you will find it among the question if you ask Chinese people, the demos, does your democracy work very well? You will be get better results than from the Japanese population. Of course, experts will judge it quite differently. So I will, we were looking to expert judgments to uh, indices uh, which measure the quality of democracy, but then we thought this cannot be enough. There must be something uh, behind it. So then we were looking to partial policy or to one of these partial regimes. For example, are civic rights challenged by uh, the so-called war against uh, Terrorism. So here I would say, uh, also to provoke uh, Pippa a bit, uh, that the reduction of legitimacy uh, belief cannot be sufficient if we try to answer these questions. So the demos, here the Euro demos, or I would say Euro demoi, because the Euro demos does not exist, uh, uh, or not really exist. Uh, we were looking uh, what the people, uh, the citizens of the European member states from the European community, and starts in 73, 
up to the European Union, and here I have figures uh, until 2010. What is quite interesting here, first, uh, the trend, here you see indeed the trendless fluctuation. <coughs> it's completely clear you cannot anything interpret here as a decline of legitimacy belief in European uh, democracies. Quite interesting, the green line here. This is Italy. Uh, and this is more or less uh, 92, 93. This was Tangentopoli, the collapse of the old party regime. And we all know who came along, our friend Silvio. And Silvio, when Silvio Berlusconi governed four, I think, four governments, three or four governments uh, during uh, this time, the Italians believed that the democracy is working better and better. They were more satisfied. If you look then for, so the people think uh, democracy is much better after Berlusconi. If you look then, I come back to this. Uh, this is the expert judgment, the best uh, you can find, the Eurobarometer. <laughs> uh, it's one of the best because it's done by the University of Zurich at the WZB. We are using 100 indicators to measure the quality of democracy. You can see everything, each single indicator and data uh, uh, in the internet. You see here the average. Again, the average does not tell you in the judgment uh, that there is a worsening of democracy. I was quite disappointed about these <laughs> results and I asked uh, my collaborators to look closer to it. However, uh, the graph did not change. Uh, you have here again Italy. This is here in 93, and then you have what well, the experts uh, are judging the quality of democracy expected, expectedly. Uh, having a lower, Italy has now a lower quality than it had before. So the experts are judging differently from the demos. Something quite interesting, who at the end is the arbiter. I want to show you another uh, brief graph. Here I distinguish between two types of institutions. To look behind the wheel of uh, this common satisfaction with democracy. And if you distinguish here non-majoritarian institution, this is military, police, and judiciary. These are those institutions of the state which a citizen cannot elect. And they have high trust in them. And those where the citizen have a say, which they can elect, here uh, parliament and the blue line governments, there is a visibly decline. So here you don't see only trendless fluctuation. Here I see a stable, quite a stable decline. Uh, unfortunately, we did not have figures which are going uh, back in the 80s and 70s, but here I see a clear trend, and political parties anyway, is something where the people do not have uh, high trust. However, here there are methodological questions. If you ask people, do you trust the party you voted for, you get much better results. So, uh, but this would not really uh, fit my argument here. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, but what you can <coughs> see, there is a difference. And there is a difference, and one could argue, yes, the people trust in these non-majoritarian state institutions, but they do not have trust in the very much anymore or declining trust in the core institutions of representative democracy. Last and third level, we were looking uh, to partial regimes. Um, there will be, hopefully soon, uh, the book come out in, in English. It is now by, uh, under review with uh, Oxford University Press. And what we found out is the following one. Looking at the electoral regime, who votes? First, 
you find a uh, visible, however not dramatic, but steady uh, decline of voter turnout. This is a tricky thing to interpret it. Uh, is it really a challenge uh, to democracy? Uh, however, then we looked uh, who is opting out, who does not go anymore uh, to the elections, and we discovered um, social selectivity. Those who are anyway not going as much to elections, the lower third of the society is dropping out more, visibly more than uh, the higher social strata. We looked at, uh, at the level of education in order to check it. So Bernhard Bessel has uh, here uh, quite uh, nice uh, data. Political rights, then we were looking who is represented in parliament. We were not looking at descriptive repre res representation, not looking whether women, for example, are better represented. They are much better represented than they were represented uh, 40 years ago. This is something which uh, one has clearly to state. We were looking to substantial <coughs> presentation, a representation, and here again we found out empirical research found out that the lower third, those with uh, only a primary education, are worse represented in parliament than the middle classes and the higher classes. Uh, what we have, if we look to the third partial regime, civil rights, who is protected? Uh, <coughs> we have a, certainly a better protection of minority rights than 40 years ago. I'm saying this uh, just to uh, hint at the fact there are this simultaneous development. This is what the crisis theories are not taking uh, sufficiently into account. They are just picking out the negative results because they don't have a theory how to discount positive and negative developments. Here, civil rights, uh, the right of homosexual, of ethnic minorities, <coughs> of religious minorities, and so forth, not to talk about uh, uh, women, it's much better than it was 40 or 50 years ago. However, the bad news is certainly about horizontal accountability, who controls. This is something where we want to do more uh, research, uh, but with the opening up of the domestic uh, polities with Europeanization and globalization, parliaments are losing a lot of their control co capacity. Some uh, matters are even no longer decided there. They may be decided by deregulated financial markets or they may be decided by institutions of the European Union or by supra other supranational regimes. And in the, the same way, I would say, who governs, there is a loss of state power to markets. So this is self-inflicted by democratic decisions of democracies to deregulate the market. Now, uh, they do not have a grip anymore on these markets, and they get uh, got driven in times of crisis, as we have seen in the uh, crisis, especially of the euro, more than in the general financial crisis. Conclusion. The problem is with uh, such a question of uh, is there a crisis of democracy? Holistic crisis theories cannot uh, be satisf uh, satisfactorily tested. This is one of the problems. However, I would refrain uh, then from uh, arguing if you cannot test it then it's not a question we should look into it. Uh, this is, however, then we have to be keen in which way we are looking into those questions, and therefore we were using these three uh, uh, strategies. As you have seen, if you just look at uh, democracy indices, you don't find a crisis of democracy. However, if you look behind uh, the wheel of the general survey question, are you satisfied with your democracy? We see this uh, divide between majoritarian and non-majoritarian institutions. 
this is what I already have said. Uh, what I think, and I already and I repeat it here, as it said, Rom Censio, uh, political inequality matters. There seems to be quite a uh, straight transformation of socio-economic in inequalities into political inequalities. And this is now even worse because the lower strata were very much relying on the judgment, a kind of cognitive shortcut of collective organizations such as trade unions or uh, working class parties. And there is a clear erosion of these parties and the lower classes today are quite different from the working class of the 1960s and 70s. Working class is no longer longer would we could, would consider uh, the lower classes of our uh, societies. Deregulation of markets matter. Uh, uh, this is one of the points where uh, I think the euro crisis has given quite uh, an empirical evidence on this question that uh, there are certain, there are there's not much space for democratic decisions to guide the uh, working of markets. And these are not minor questions. These are major questions for uh, the life of uh, the people. Did I quote you again? So your citation index will <laughs> rise. Uh, the majority of uh, of the <laughs> citizens may be less critical, as your as a title of one of your books suggests, uh, critical citizens. So the people seem to be more output oriented, and they do not judge it as so problematic in its majority. Not the young, uh, well-educated people organized in NGOs, certainly not. But again the lower uh, 30 or 50 percent of the po population. They may not care. They may not care that there is a shift to a more executive driven, less controlled democratic uh, polity. Last, and uh, I finish <coughs> unfortunately with uh, a pessimistic uh, argument knowing that uh, John Keane is always more optimistic than me in these matters. If we look to democratic innovations, <coughs> and there is an ongoing uh, intensive debate, how can we cure these malaises of representative democracy? There is an emergence of the debate on direct democracy. And I just came back from a complete different scene of political scientists compared to you sitting here from Canberra. I, I had the pleasure to discuss two days uh, deliberative democracy. And the moment where I mentioned parties, elections, what are you talking about? This is a matter of the past. Uh, we have to talk about deliberation. But my argument is, all what we know about these nice innovations of democracy, direct democracy, referenda, deliberative democracy, digital democracy, they are socially even more selective. They are more demanding. They are more demanding in terms of cognitive capabilities. And so it may be not the cure for these malaises of representative democracy, it may be the acceleration of it. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Wolfgang. So John will respond and <coughs> give his perspective on it. Uh, well, herzlichen and Dank, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here in Sydney again, and thank you too for Pippa for the invitation. Uh, to summarize, uh, you know, there is an old joke that what is an optimist? You did mention these terms. An optimist is someone who thinks that things could be much worse than they are, and probably that's a summary of, of Wolfgang's paper. Uh, and I'm, uh, you say I'm an optimist, but broadly, broadly I'm in agreement, but there are four things that I want to say that complicate uh, the 
argument and the conceptual handling and the implications that you drew. You are, as a preamble, it's, it's important to see that what you, uh, the, the reservation you have about this concept of crisis is, I think, uh, correct. I think the reservation is that this is a very strong term. And as you say from Hippocrates, crisis, uh, is a medical term and it is a, it is a crucial turning point where the life and death of the patient is at stake. Uh, its root uh, term in Greek, I understand, is to decide or to judge. So, so a crisis is a turning point, a moment, a, a, a dramatic moment where something may not survive unless there is a, a, a change, of course, through uh, decisions, uh, through judgments. In this sense, um, the term is a strong term. It has connotations of dysfunctionality, of uh, death. Torschlusspanik uh, in German is midlife crisis. And it literally means uh, that you, it's a sort of shut the door panic. You know, the fear that you're on the wrong side of the closing door. So it's a very dramatic term. And rightly, I think, you point out that uh, there is probably either a need to drop the term or to, uh, to moderate it to take account of the trending uh, disintegrations and transformations that uh, normally the concept wouldn't be used uh, uh, to, to describe. Um, I want to say four things. Uh, one is on the basis of an agreement with your point about the need to uh, set aside a dramatic uh, uh, concept of crisis. W one of them is, it's the most abstract philosophical point that you could have made. Democracy is the most radical political form so far invented. And it's the most radical because its core principle is equalization of power and life chances and identities. In this sense, as I'd say the French school, but going back to Tocqueville, but today's French school, Jean-Louis Nancy and so on, point out, democracy is the friend of crisis. Uh, if you think about it very abstractly, it is always uh, Democrats and democratic institutions are always, when they work properly, they are always looking to undermine inequities. So there is constantly dissatisfaction, motion, you know, the promiscuity of the spirit of, of democracy. It's always unfinished business. Uh, Derrida's democracy to come is the shortest sentence to, to, to summarize this. So it may be that actually the, there is an affinity between the concept of crisis and democracy that you could have spoken about. Uh, that would probably work in your favor, that we should calm down a little bit. If I had time, I would say a lot about intellectuals and crisis. I think we intellectuals, Maybe we're overstating our role. But I, I, I think we have a certain predilection for talking, you know, crisis. And there's a whole history of that, but that I won't say much about. Second, um, it's fair to say, and it didn't come through clearly enough for me, that the reigning orthodox, usually it's called liberal democratic, you call it rule of law democracy model, is disintegrating. It has a declining plausibility. There is a sort of slow burn crisis in your sense of this orthodox uh, model, which you can find in uh, many fields of political science and other uh, areas of the human sciences. What was, what was this model? I speak about it in past tense. Four qualities were always listed in this orthodox liberal democratic model. You have to have a territorial state that guarantees sovereignty, and it's better to have a shared sense of nationhood. Fukuyama has once again repeated this in the most recent uh, volume that he's published. Second, a democracy, so something prior to uh, elections, but democracy uh, is secondly a form, political form, where the people are sovereign. Third, uh, the core institution is periodic elections and a form of elected representation, so parliaments and so on. And the fourth is that it's always in the liberal democratic uh, reigning orthodox model that there should be rule of law, there should be a civil society, and there should be markets. These are usually bundled up as the fourth quality. Now, it does seem to me that 
uh, it's implicit in some of what you say, Pippa will not like this at all, but it does seem to me, thirdly, uh, that there are things going on empirically that do deeply call this model into question. The third point, this is uh, a reference to the geographic differentiations. We didn't say much about this. There are polities that I would say on empirical grounds, whether you, however you measure it, are actually in um, at least a slow burn crisis and possibly something more calamitous than that. And I think the instances are Greece. Uh, I think the experience of Greece in the last six years and the unresolved dynamics, uh, the heavy politics that having just come back from Europe, you see if you're on the ground there, it's really heavy <coughs> politics. Uh, where there is a kind of hatred uh, of the Troika and, and where negotiations behind scenes, you know, when Tsipras meets Draghi, uh, they barely can be in the same room as each other. And there is something, the imposition of austerity and the, the collapse of a market economy. And one could also say, you know, in Hong Kong, there is a, there is a crisis in the at least slow burn uh, uh, variety. But I don't want to say anything more about that. And finally... We probably need a, a term like trending transformations, Pippa. <laughs> trending transformations, <laughs> or trans tran transformational trends or something. Trend, let's call them trending transformations. I think that uh, what's missing, you know we talked about it for years, uh, is that political science is full of amnesiacs. Uh, there's no understanding much of the past, and we have no data, and the past is just a sort of it's, it's a sort of gray area. If you put on uh, a pair of eyes, so to say, in the back of your head and think about some of the bigger <coughs> trends, which would be the only way that you could talk about these uh, uh, trending transformations, you see at least four things going on. And I'd say that you, these need to be built into your account and they have implications for the Electoral Integrity Project. I don't think they uh, uh, destroy the project. That's the happy news, Pippa. I think, on the contrary, they they might well make uh, give it a new significance. But the four trends are: you briefly touched on this, the 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 growth, the pluralization of forms of unelected representation. It's happening, and I'd say among the very best works that you could read, it's a bit of a slog. Is Pierre Rosenvallon's. Uh, relatively recently translated book on legitimacy. My Monetary Democracy, which is the 504th definition of uh, democracy, is a contribution to this. The, the argument is that since roughly 1945, when there were only a dozen democracies, electoral democracies left on the face of the earth, we've seen uh, the growth of innovations of, of the pluralization of forms of unelected representation that greatly changed the ecology and dynamics and help, uh, as Rosa Vallon, uh himself points out, help us understand, though we don't have good theories of it, that elections are only one way of handling power. And it may be that there is a certain desacralization of elections going on in every or most electoral democracies. In other words, democracies require a more complicated ecology of handling power and forms of legitimacy. Um, election, some of them predate the 19 post 45 period. Election commissions are a very basic example. You know, the pouvoir neutre that was much discussed in the meeting. An elected election commission would be a disaster for every democracy because it politicizes it in a way, uh, in party political terms. Um, what is, if you think about it, why, election commission, why the election commission in India is one of the most uh, publicly um, uh, there's great, greatest public loyalty to it is because it isn't elected. Uh, Rosenvillon reminds us that the public service model was a basic invention of the great crisis of democracy, and it was from roughly 1890 to 1939. Uh, today, the ABC is much more popular than any party. Uh, how do you explain this? It is a form of representation. It, it represents, it represents opinions in all their diversity, and it does so in largely a non-market way, and it does so sometimes by heaping abuse and criticism on the electoral mechanisms, and for those reasons, it is popular. 
You mentioned central banks. Uh, I, I want to steer away from that for a moment, but they're often cited as another instance of unelected representation. Uh, my own view is that the European Central Bank, as has been pointed out by Harold James, had a, a bad beginning. It was basically a, uh, an institution set up by the banks. And that is one of the reasons why you know, it's hated in some parts. The Germans, I didn't watch them. <laughs> um, I do think, uh, to, to just sketch this final uh, point um, about one uh, trend, I think that the growth of new network politics you know, this new type of politics that's outside the election system, that, uh, that occupies physical place, that is multi-mediated, that broadcasts to the world complaints, um, that is, uh, that, that is, that is uh, a contribution to a form of the, the spread of forms of representation that are not elected. And then all of the monetary institutions, uh, these watchdogs and barking dog institutions, uh, many of them are much more popular than uh, parties and parliaments. And by the way, they are, uh, I know you, you like this thesis that they're socially selective. That is not true for India and it is not true for Latin America. Many of these institutions, local religious courts and satyagraha, and so, I mean, these are all inventions of the post-45 period that are outside the electoral cycle and which add a certain dynamism and complexity and a rough and tumble to democracy. Uh, and that's good, it seems to me, but it has implications for electoral understanding to, uh, understandings of democracy. I'll quickly finish because there are three other trends I want to say something about. Second big trend is the growth of cross-border chains of power. Uh, I suppose if you want one symbol of this, it might be the National Security Agency. And the counterpoint, is the growth of uh, efforts to democratize those chains of power. That is, what I think is happening uh, globally is that the spirit of democracy has sort of escaped from the territorial uh, straitjacket, and there are efforts to try to build uh, mechanisms that restrain arbitrary power in cross-border settings. The growth of global publics is a very clear instance, but we have all kinds of networks that operate uh, to try to um, actually add substance to the meaning of global democracy or cross-border democracy. This is significant. The last time there was such a discussion was in the 1920s when, of course, global democracy was uh, defeated politically by war and fascism and so on. Uh, third trend is the greening of democracy. I think the growth, the invention, and the spread of mechanisms of representation of our relationship with the biosphere is a very, uh, it's a novelty of our times. It is uh, entirely positive. It is badly theorized. Um, and many of the mechanisms of representation are unelected. Green parties are an exception. But for example, the growth of citizen science networks or food sovereignty initiatives uh, or, for example, bioregional assemblies, the constitutionalization of the biosphere. It's happened first in Bhutan, and it happened second in Mongolia, and I checked. Uh, you know, that to be a citizen is to be, is to be duty-bound to protect the biosphere of the polity in which one lives. This is something new, and it is one of these long-term trends that greatly complicates the orthodox model. And finally, the scariest thought, and here I get pessimistic. Um, it does seem to me that uh, the last great, well-observed, the last great slow-burn 